Welcome to uh, track, C uh, track C session four. Uh, my name is K.R. Yoon. I'm the HR director for DuPont Asia Pacific. Um, in this session, we would like to discuss about the uh, uh, standardization, developing standard uh, for the non-formal education. This might be a new topic for many participants here, but this is going to change the quality of non-formal education and training services. When you say non-formal education and training, the formal training education, uh, formal education means uh, offered, uh, that's uh, education offered by the uh, schools, uh, elementary schools, high schools, university, other colleges. But non-formal education and training, I think uh, Dr. Rao will explain about that later. But that's uh, the learning services offered by other institutes, other consulting firms. So once we develop the standard, uh, international standard for this learning, uh, for the learning providers, this can upgrade the learning services. And uh, for the Korean, especially Korean uh, learning service providers, it's very important to understand uh, what's going on for the developing the standard uh, internationally. We have uh, three speakers here today. Uh, first, I changed the sequence a little bit after discussing with the speakers. Uh, Dr. Thomas Rao. Uh, Dr. Thomas Rao is the chairperson for developing this international standard. Uh, and uh, I heard uh, next week in Montreal, there will be a global meeting for that committee. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rao is a project manager for RKW, which is a center for productivity and innovation in Germany. So Dr. Rao came from Berlin. And the next speaker is Kumi Nakamura-san. Japan already formed an organization to prepare and also develop the uh, Japan standard for non-formal training and education services. In Korea, uh, we, we are learning from Japan's experience and uh, currently we have uh, two leaders leading this effort, uh, Dr. Che from the Korean Agency of uh, Technical and Standard, and Dr. Jung from the, sorry, Kribet. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to pronounce. <laughs> okay, um, so we learn from Nakamura-san from the Japan experience and the Japan's activities in preparing for this uh, standardization. And then uh, we also have uh, <clears throat> another speaker from US, Dr. Michael Leimbach. Uh, Michael is a, a vice president of the Wilson Learning. Wilson Learning is a the worldwide uh, training and learning service provider. And uh, he's also representing the USA committee for this uh, ISO effort. So uh, I'd like to give about uh, 20 minutes for each speaker. And so we can have about uh, 10 minutes question and answer at the end of the session. But this is going to be a, a quite interesting a new topic, especially for the 
learning service providers. So, shall we start with yeah. Dr. Rao? Good afternoon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak about this standard for learning service providers we developed in the ISOC committee. It is a standard for quality management for um, learning service providers. And I first want to introduce or introduce myself, uh, my company. Then I want to speak about the uh, activities of ISO in the educational field, and especially then about this new developed standard, and let, uh, then about the advantages of this new standard. My company, RKW, is a very traditional company, it was uh, founded in the last century, in 1921, with a view to support small and medium-sized enterprises. It was supported from the Ministry of Economics and from one of the large German firms, Siemens, because they knew that um, the development of a strong industry needs small and medium-sized enterprises. And in our work, especially education, is one of the main topics. We are now an independent, non-profit organization with 3,700 members. Uh, the members are companies and individuals. And we are represented in every German state, have also one center for productivity, which is financed by the Ministry of Economics at the Eschborn. And uh, through our structure, we can support the small and medium-sized enterprises. So we have in close contact to local governments and administration are in close contact to discuss policy issues. And we are also in close contact and discussions with associations and societies from the employer union to the labor union. So um, we try to, well, get all the opinions in the society and also being part of the opinion-making process. We work together with educational and scientific institutions, especially in our fields and in our work to develop quality standards. And we have a network of consultants and trainers. So we have a lot of experts accredited with us which we can uh, use to, to give consultancy to firms and also trainings. So these are the main, our main fields, consultancy, training, uh, develop projects and give information and transfer of instruments to small and medium-sized enterprises. Well, now to the work of the ISO committee. I have here uh, the number of standards ISO is developing each year. That's a very tremendous number. And um, this should give you a short well, overview about the work of ISO. But among these standards are hardly to find any educational standards. There are only very few. And that despite um, well, standardization also in the uh, service sector started in the mid-90s and is, uh, became, uh, in the meantime, a very uh, important field of work of ISO, but education is still underrepresented. I have here tried to, to give a picture of uh, commissions, of committees in ISO, which are engaged in standardization. In the mid, you see the okay. So uh, this is our new committee. I come later to talk about this. So we have mainly activities in the field of quality management system. This is this committee. 176 
in this committee also the very famous uh, quality management systems 9001 are developed and uh, all these uh, row of 9000 um, quality management standards. And within this committee and standards was developed for in-house training, um, but it wasn't very much accepted in the practice. And in this committee also in so-called workshop agreement was um, well elaborated and workshop agreement is an instrument below an official standard. It is an interpretation of a standard and you use this instrument if you can't agree about some topics. Yeah, so uh, it's not a standard and it's only valid for three years. So there the special problem was that they tried to define standards also for the public sector and this is really difficult in the educational field. So they could only agree to such an instrument like an international workshop agreement. It was prolonged for three years, but now they have to think about uh, a new form uh, to, uh, well, to take the results in a more lasting uh, kind of standard. Then we have a very interesting committee that's the committee GTC1. There's a subcommittee 36, and within this subcommittee, uh, e-learning norms, e-learning standards are elaborated, and they are, uh, well, f especially for the e-learning field, for uh, the application of e-learning also, uh, standards have been developed. And we have in, in some committees, this is only an example, in some committees related to their normal work, like in this one for the tourism and uh, related services, there were uh, developed uh, safety regulations related to minimum requirements for scuba divers. So in some committees we have related to their topic also standards uh, which are in the educational field. But there's no committee which is only geared to education. And that was why we um, made this initiative to, well, to build a new committee. And this was committee 232, which was first for educational services. Later on, we renamed it to learning services for non-formal education and training. Well, on our first meeting, we discussed these educational services and we decided to name it um, learning services to have more the focus on the learning process and the learner. And we also decided to, um, well, to limit our work to non-formal education. Non-formal education in the sense like the UNESCO definition in ISCAT 97 there is non-formal education defined, everything what is not formal education. <laughs> so, uh, well, what is not initial uh, second, uh, or secondary education or university levels, but only the first degree in university level. Everything else is non-formal education, at least uh, education which is institutionalized and in a sustained form. So we could live with this um, formulation after a long discussion uh, because all other um, attempts to, to name this committee with further education or continuous education didn't meet really that what we intended to do um, because actually we only wanted to, to take out uh, all those kinds of uh, education which are under the governmental authority because it is too difficult for a privately owned for a privately organized organization like ISO uh, to draw standards in the field uh, where the governments have the authority. So actually this formulation is due to these facts that we would well, uh, 
intent to, to exclude this formal sector. But, uh, as in the next sentence is said, transfer, transparency in relation to formal education system. That means that all the formal uh, institutions in the formal sector can use our standards if they uh, are the opinion, of the opinion to that they uh, well, fulfill their requirements. And we have now already uh, among the first institutions which uh, intend to uh, work with this new standard also universities and uh, educational uh, institutions which are nearly connected to universities. And we said that we uh, concentrate our work on uh, adult education, so we took the figure 16, but it is different from country to country um, where the, this level of adult education starts. These are the participants now in our committee. You see there are quite a lot of developed countries and also countries in transition, but developing countries are underrepresented. So we try also to, to get more members from developing countries, but this is mostly a, a, a question of financing these activities. Uh, our first step, our first work in this committee uh, was to draw these new standard learning services providers, learning services for non-formal education and training, basic requirements for service providers. And at the same time, we uh, founded an ad hoc group research with an aim to to have research work and make a feasibility study uh, in the educational field as a prerequisite to formulate our standard. And the task was to uh, research on existing standards and internationally agreed documents um, within the scope of our committee and also identifying the needs for international standards. Well, and um, they found out that there are quite a number of challenges for the standard. So first, changes in the educational market itself. Then the delimination to governmental regulated and financed educational services, coping with plenty of national standards, and also the international comparability then management standards for learning service providers and the possibility of higher quality standards which has to be given in a standard. So there should be always a close relationship in formulating standards. So um, as a basic, but always gives the opportunity for, um, for development. The, uh, standards does not um, hinder the development and hinder the uh, well, implementation of new forms of education. First to the challenges of, in the educational market. Um, the chair of market-oriented or competitive-oriented learning service providers in the educational market is growing. In Germany, for instance, there are in between approximately 25,000 um, provider in the uh, further education, including independent trainer, which are operating uh, independently on the market. And they are in a well, very intense competition. Publicly financed or partly financed educational institutions compete more and more with other learning service provider in the educational market. And um, also the share of privately financed education is growing. And all this requires more transparency, it requires systems to compare offers and also systems to compare different learning service providers. 
especially also tailored services, so services which are customized to company needs, also the individual individualization and personalized services appear as a general trend. This leads to increased requirements and quality assurance, so for instance for cost science or uh, the competence of the trainers. The demand for recognition is increasing in all countries and the quality of education or training providers um, offer determines whether or what extent they will enjoy market success. And in line with corporate requirements and with John C's, consideration of the learning needs at the individual level requires greater quality control in order to support and safeguard the lifelong learning process. All these changes in the educational market, as I said, require systems uh, for an improved quality and also uh, for, an, for a more uh, defined management system. So it is necessary under those market conditions also to have an uh, specially market-geared management for instance, with a financial management and a risk management, which is rather new also for educational service provider. Then, as, as I said, we, we wanted to, to have a uh, strict line to the uh, governmental regulated services. It is um, well comparable to the GATS formulation, GATS, uh, the uh, in the World Trade Organization, the, the round on general agreement on trade and services. They excluded all the services provided in the exercise of governmental authority because it's too complicated and um, you, you would have be too, too much um, problems in finding a consensus. coping with a plenty of national standards. So we have in rather a number of countries the development of different quality management systems. For instance, in Germany, there are 20 different quality management systems for learning service providers. And that makes simply no sense because no customer, no learner can... Um, does know what each quality management system means, and so we, there's no transparency in the market. Yeah. And many national standards also supersede the international standards in praxis. So, for instance, also the ISO 9001 is only used to a an, to an rather small share within uh, the educational service market because it's too unspecific for the educational service providers. Well, although such standards are used, but not to a uh, large extent. And moreover, it was also one of the reasons, for instance, in Germany, in Germany that so many national standards developed because ISO 9001 didn't uh, fulfill their requirements. The certification provider exists. In general, they are not compulsory. So um, that's in most countries. Only in, in some countries you have some kind of compulsory certification process for quality management system. Lately, for instance, in September, the Egypt trade minister um, made a declaration that all service providers in uh, continuous education have to be certified by ISO uh, norms. In Germany, for instance, for, for labor of the labor office requires um, a certification according to a quality management system. If, you, if this uh, service provider wants to be, get funds from the labor office, so those forms of uh, well, a kind of compulsory certification exist in the USA, in Australia, Germany, Ireland. 
international comparability. So the proliferation of national and regional standards which are geared to specific national conditions and as a result there is a missing transparency and comparability in the international trade with educational services. So there's no standard so far in the international market which allows the comparison between uh, different quality management systems. And the growing share of cross-border education activities and educational enterprises with locations in different countries which are subject to national certification requirement. And this growing share also increases the demand for an international valid standard. And there's also the danger of protectionist interpretation of national standards. If you have national quality standards developed which are different, then you can easily use those standards also to prevent educational exports or import from other countries. So there are two ways out. The first way would be to, to adapt the national standards to some kind of framework uh, for quality management, but there's still no real transparency and comparability and also no guarantee that these standards remain state of the art. And there's always the danger of misinterpretation if you have different standards. So the, the real way out is in, to have a common standard, an international standard. And that's also in the core of ISO. ISO comes from a Greek word, ISOS, and means equal. So general features um, for these standards that it incorporates market requirements and customer requirements that are typic typical for the learning service providers. So that's one special issue in differentiation to the ISO 9001, which is gener generic and very general. And the learning process and programs are core elements of these standards and there should be also an integration of requirements for management system as a guarantee of conformity. And lately the consideration of the speciality of learning and the requirements of, for the management systems. So these were the general features um, at the beginning we had to consider also. Then for a standard you have to define minimum requirements in the sense of a last common denominator because these have to be in conditions which uh, each service provider can fulfill. So it's not a question of developing excellence but to have an, a certain level which has to be guaranteed but it has, must be open also to develop excellency. An holistic approach, so uh, every part in, within these standards is dependent of the other parts. Okay. So we defined a generic standard for the learning services and now we uh, try also to define specific standards. We have started on an initiative of China with language learning services and next week in Montreal we uh, will discuss new work item proposals for further uh, areas for standardization. This by the way is a standard now, the official form. It was published on the 1st of September and the standard, uh, the standard has um, the following main well, components. Learning services is well, the most important component. Then the management of the learning service provider, competencies and skills of learning providers and assessment. And these four um, well, subjects uh, were under discussion also in our committee. We formed uh, subcommittees for, for them and um, 
and the final standard learning services is a main chapter and management services a second main chapter and competencies and skills as well as assessment is included in these both chapters. The first chapter is built according to the process model uh, which is well, used in general in management systems. So you start with the with the needs of the stakeholder or interested parties. And after analyzing these needs, you determine the learning needs. And on this basis of determining the learning needs, you design the learning services itself. And following is the provision of learning services. And Within this provision of learning services, we have a continuous process also of monitoring and improving this learning service. Dr. Rao, you have about two minutes. I have two minutes. Oh. Okay, and uh, the evaluation as a fourth point. And these are the under uh, chapters within this chapter of learning services. Then we have in this next uh, parts, the management of learning service providers. So there are the general requirements uh, for management systems within this uh, chapter. I have to hurry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the advantages of this new standard are first the benefits for service providers itself, so they can improve their processes and they have clearly defined and documented um, processes also as their internal development for quality improves and this standard may also be this, uh, the basis then for further standards in a specific field. This also is of benefit for the service providers. Such a management system is also a part of motivational stuff of staff because you have a competency, competency development included and also the active participation of staff in the management process. The benefit for a learner is mainly transparency but also the improvement of the learning process itself and also the liability of the office if there is a certified uh, management system. Also the of informations about the uh, learning process and the learning offer uh, improved with such a management system. The benefit for companies which are using all these standards, they can more easily compare between offers from service provider and on the basis of standardized um, offers, they can also gear their own requirements better to the uh, possibilities of the uh, service provider. And there's all the benefit for contract planning authorities and for instance for employment offices, subsidies, public tender, because they have a more reliable basis for their um, tenders or other forms of uh, work they have to transmit to the learning service provider. And there's also a benefit for international cooperation um, because it is more, more, uh, it's easily to, to come to an agreement if you work on the same basis, on the same standard. And uh, it is also uh, more comparable and so you improve the possibility of educational exports and educational cooperation. And it's also the basis for further instruments for the uh, cooperation of um, educational service providers. Um, we developed, for instance, quality guidelines uh, for the cooperation of educational service providers, which are an uh, addition to a quality management system. So to each uh, requirement of the quality management system is an additional requirement in the international field. And if you have a a uh, solid and unique standard. You can also develop international valid uh, 
requirements for the international cooperation. So I'm in time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas Rao. Uh, Dr. Rao introduced about the developing international standards for learning service providers. It's uh, about this framework and the possibilities starting from the, the ISO TC 232, the first educational committee, and the development of a standard for learning service providers and the advantage of the new standard. I gave uh, 10 more minutes because he's the chairperson for this committee. <laughs> okay, next speaker is uh, uh, Nakamura-san. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to be here. And uh, first, I would like to introduce the, the association I work for. It is called Japan Association for Management of Training and Education. We call it uh, JAMOTE. It is a new association that represents uh, different learning service providers in Japan, newly established to deal with the TC23 activities that uh, Dr. Rao just uh, introduced. And uh, in this presentation, we, I will be talking about the background of international standardization in education and training service field in Japan and the implication of ISO 2390 in Japan and also the implication, the implication in Asia and uh, further development. So I would like to uh, briefly look back how what happened in the 15, last 15 years. First of all, because the information technology developed, uh, there has been a dr dramatic uh, uh, industry structure change. We are now focusing from the manufacturing to the age of information and services. And now we have more and more multinational companies and they are uh, replacing their production base from uh, their own country to overseas for the cheap labor and cheap material. And there are more and more companies working with uh, companies in other countries as, uh, as a type of merging or affiliation or consolidation. So in Japan, in addition to these uh, changes, we have our own changes. First, the traditional work environment has changed. The Japanese style management has changed and no longer lifelong employment system and seniority based payment system are less and less uh, popular in Japan. The seniority based wage system is that the, the longer you work for one company that you get more paid. So that system has changed and now the companies are f uh, focusing on the efficiency and performance, high performance of the staff instead of the the time they worked for one company. So, and another uh, change is the diversi diversifying view of work. Because of the falling birth rates and aging population, now the working population in Japan is shrinking. And because of the shrinking uh, working population, we have to think about the different ways of working. Traditionally, women quit their job after they get married or give birth to children, but because of the shrinking uh, working population, now the society is thinking about the, the recognizing the importance of bringing back these women into the labor market. So as, as, a, ta as a form of full-time or part-time, we have to think about you know, bringing back these women into the working uh, labor population. And another trend in this is that uh, we have more and more international workers now. Look back uh, five years ago, we didn't have so many Chinese w uh, workers at the you know, shops or convenience stores, but now we have so many com uh, Chinese uh, people working at the sales staff. So I really feel the change of this uh, internationalizing the workforce in Japan. And now Japan needs very efficient and high professional human resource. 
This is just to show that the trend, uh, population trend in Japan, as you can see, the world, the population is expanding, but the Japan, the population is shrinking because of the falling birth rate. And as you can see, well, maybe you can't see. Uh, let's see. Here is the population for seniors. So it's expanding, but the working population here, as you can see, shrinking. So we really have a problem. And another trend in um, this uh, demographic change is that we have more and more international marriages. In 2005, we have about 6% uh, of the old marriages are international marriage, and it went down to 5% in 2009. But if you just focus on the Tokyo ratio, it's about 10%. So we really think that um, international trend in demographic and the working uh, labor force is uh, coming. So we really think that uh, international equivalence of education training services is a very important issue in Japan. In terms of the qualifications that people in other countries receive, we have to make sure the quality of the services they receive in other countries as uh, learning services. So uh, as people come in from other countries, we, we would like to make sure that the people are trained and the qualifications or certifications they have are good ones. So uh, why the international standard is important in Japan today, in terms of, uh, the, from the perspectives of learners and education training service providers and society, now we have more and more troubles between uh, learners and education training service providers these days. In recent years, we had two bankrupt incidents with uh, big learning language service providers. So the learners had, didn't good, uh, couldn't receive the services they paid for. That was a very, good, uh, very big issue in Japan. And there is no neutral indicators for the quality of learning uh, products and services in Japan. There are some associations of learning service providers in Japan, but they have all different uh, uh, standards and code of ethics. So it's really hard to say they are neutral and objectives, objective. And uh, from the education training service provider's perspective, it is hard to differentiate from oneself from uh, other competitors because there are no neutral or objective uh, standards to, uh, to assure, to claim that they have good uh, services. And because of the shrinking uh, population, many of the companies want to go outside of Japan to uh, look for business opportunities in other countries, but they don't have name value or credibility on their learning services in other countries. And at many learning service providers, it is a very obscure what, how they evaluate the learning services they provide. And from the society perspective, it is, um, we, we say we don't have direct consumer protection for learning, service, uh, learning services for learners. As, you can, as I mentioned, that we had two bankruptcy for, uh, with the language service providers in Japan. And no objective framework of providers' uh, quality improvement. We don't know how they are trying to improve their uh, quality of services. And because of because we don't know how they evaluate their learning services, it is hard to say how their outcome, the outcome of their learning services is uh, reflected in society. And there's a trend, more and more um, learning services are outsourced to outside learning service providers in Japan. So these are the why we need international standardization uh, in Japan today. This is the structure of how we work with the TC232 activities in Japan. The JAMOTE, the association I work for, manages all the TC232 activities. 
And that is um, certified by JISC, uh, Japanese Industrial Standards Committee, which is under the control of Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. So Jamote manages the ISO TC232 Japanese Mirror Committee. And under the committee, we have two subcommittees. One is for planning and research, and the other one is for the language learning standards that uh, China has just proposed, and we'll be talking about this in Canada next week. And in the Japanese Mirror Committee, concerned organizations and companies are represented. And also we have experts from uh, universities and observers from relevant uh, ministries, such as Ministry of Education, Culture, Sport, Science and Technology, Ministry of Health, Labor, Welfare, and Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. And Ministry of Education is concerned about non-formal education part of this uh, activity. And Ministry of Health and la the Labor is concerned about the training part of this uh, uh, activity. And the Ministry of Economy is in charge of the service industry and also all the standardization activities. So we have to work with three different uh, ministries. And they are observers, but they are very active in this uh, committee. This is to show that the scope of TC232 or ISO 2990 that Dr. Rao have just uh, mentioned, the, we had discussion of what is non-formal education training and what is formal training uh, education. So we made this picture to, make, to understand our situation in Japan, that uh, here is the, the type of providers. Is it public sector or private sector? And here is to show what types of services or learning services they uh, provide. Is it formal or is it non-formal? And the scope of TC232 or the end, uh, ISO 2390 is the yellow part, we think that uh, this is the scope. The universities and uh, other um, public education institutes, they are formal education institutes, but sometimes they provide no formal education programs or training services, so they are crossing the two boxes. And uh, language schools and continuing education institutes and private uh, cram schools, they are under the scope of TC232. And maybe some people might argue differently, but this is uh, how we understood our situation in Japan. So I mentioned about the reasons why we need international standards in Japan, and now I want to talk about the examples of impacts of ISO 2390 in Japan. And ISO 2390 can be the neutral indicator for the quality of learning products and services. We have different uh, opinions from different uh, concerned parties like uh, learning service providers, ministries, and associations of uh, uh, language service providers or vocational training service providers. So we think that this is pretty neutral compared to other associations created uh, standards. And that would hopefully uh, decrease the trouble between learners and providers. And for the education service providers, and because if they are certified against 2390, they can differentiate from other uh, competitors that are not certified by 2390. And the ISO is recognized in so many different countries, we think that that will bring up their name value and the trust toward the quality of the services they provide in other countries. And because ISO 2390 have um, requirements for evaluations, we think that uh, evaluation methods for education and training services can be improved uh, in, at, the, at the providers. And for society, that because if 2390 is, is indication of the quality services that learning service providers provide, we think that that can be direct consumer protection and 
learners can choose the service providers with the certification. And because uh, you have to improve your quality, uh, the services as a requirement of the ISO 2990, we think that can be the objective framework or start, you know, objective framework at the providers. And because the learning service services are evaluated, we think that some you know, reflection of the learning services outcome can be done in society. And now the quality of uh, learning services is uh, ensured by the ISO 2990. We think more and more people or companies will outsource their learning service pro services to outside uh, learning service providers. So what's the implication in Asia? We think that these standards can be a mutual tool because we need that uh, mutual standardization tool to ensure the education and training quality in Asia. As I mentioned, there are so many people or more and more people are moving beyond the countries. So we think this is to ensure the quality of services they receive in other countries. And if we can ensure the quality of learning services in, in other countries, that means we can uh, share the learning service resources in other countries, not only in Japan, but in other countries. That will facilitate maybe the movement of more people beyond the countries. But that is not enough to ensure the, the skills and knowledge of people who uh, go beyond the country borders. We need a system to manage the education training records and the scheme to utilize the education training records maybe as a form of personal card. So in order to uh, manage the education training records, we need to think about uh, what is the value of education training? We need to make sure that the learners are getting what they are supposed to uh, get as, a form, as competency or skills or knowledge. What they can do is more important than what they just know. So what the learner can do after completing the program can be really evaluated, need to be really evaluated. This is the cyclical uh, human resource development model that uh, Waseda University, Research Institute of Information Technology at Waseda University uh, may, uh, made in collaboration with our association. This was part of the uh, research project commissioned by Ministry of uh, Economy. And this is to show that how industry, government, and academia can cooperate in order to, uh, in, in order to uh, improve the human resource management or development as a society. And actually, under the research project, we established the education training records system. And this is the system. I don't have the time to go into the details, but uh, the system has career record and skill metrics and a course, re course record, skill metrics, and career information, and a reference of course information. Career record means that the record of the individual's training and education. And career information is the professional, uh, the record of professional experiences that the, one, the individual had. And skill metrics is the list of professions and the list of skills and uh, knowledge and competency that corresponding or required by the uh, listed professions. And reference of the course information is the course information that are available in order to improve your, the, the individual's uh, skills and uh, knowledge. This is another uh, slides to explain, but I just don't have time, so I skip it. And the application of education and training records, the learner's input is education training records, such as program content and an outcome, evaluation, you know, acquired, and evaluation and acquired competence, and past professional experience, and targeted career goals. 
So they put all the information into the system and it tells you, it, it helps the individual to visualize the gap between the targeted goals, uh, career goals, and the current uh, state of your skills and knowledge. And it tells you the, the courses you need to take in order to uh, fill the gap between your targeted goal and the career goal. So that's the merit for the learners of this uh, education, uh, the record system. And for the uh, companies, that this system will help the companies to strategically plan human resource development. And also, you, uh, they can use as a reference point when they are hiring from outsiders. So this is uh, what we worked on. Uh, and this is something we would like to propose. Uh, there's in, in Europe, there is called Asia Pass, and because uh, Euro Pass, and we would like to propose the similar thing in Asia. The future trend in Asia is more globalization activities, and there will be division of labors, and need, need to ensure the skilled labor, uh, personnel beyond countries. So, if we have something like the record, the education training record, you could, uh, the individual put the information in Asia Pass and it is easier to uh, access the education training records to see if the, in, the one individual is, you know, can work in your country. Because you want to make sure the person you work in your company or in your country have good, um, uh, credibility. So this is something that we are thinking about beyond ISO 2390 application in Japan. Thank you for your attention. Uh, th thank you, Nakamura-san. Uh, Nakamura-san introduced about uh, the background of international standardization in education and training service field in Japan with uh, uh, they have an association called uh, uh, JMOTE. Uh, so very active in preparing for these uh, standardization activities. And uh, she also shared about the future development in Japan and also for the Asia, like uh, Asia Path. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Leinbach. 안녕하세요. You don't know how long I practiced that. <laughs> I'm honored to be here to talk to you about two critical issues facing human resource development and learning services um, in the U.S. and I think around the world. And it shows extreme interest in understanding the role of standards um, in helping our industry move forward and grow and be more creative. The two issues are really the, the balance of the need for consistency, for having clear expectations of what's going to happen and to be able to replicate learning, but balancing that with the need for creativity and innovation within learning services. In essence, it's the balance or the relationship between standards for our industry and creativity and innovations in our industry. What I'd like to do in my presentation is really begin a dialogue around the state of learning services industry in the U.S. and its impact on the world. Um, I'd like to do this by first talking a little bit about what learning services means to the U.S. and our economy, how standards have helped learning services in the U.S. to grow and change, and the core innovations that I think are driving forward our industry within the U.S. and I think around the world. The, the benefits or the outcome of this will be the ability to advance learning services industry globally. I want to start out to express my interest in standards and these issues, talk a little bit about the company I work for, Wilson Learning Worldwide. We see our mission as helping people and organizations achieve performance with fulfillment. We believe that effective employees are also employees who feel challenged and fulfilled in their work. We do this by providing human performance improvement solutions for organizations. These are solutions 
not just around learning, but we believe that it's important that learning result in performance change for the individual and for the organization. And we do this in three major areas, leadership, sales, and individual effectiveness. Global standards are important to us because we operate in about 40 different countries worldwide. And as a result, it is, if we did not have global standards to help manage the relationships among our um, distributors and our, our different offices, we would put a lot of resources into meeting local standards in that work. So it's very important to us to look at the value of global standards and how we can all have a consistent view of human resource and human resource development in our society. It's also important to the U.S. economy overall. Um, uh, U.S. companies spend about $130 billion a year on learning services um, in the U.S., about $1,000 per employee. Um, and in addition, when you look at that by what they spend learning services on, external services, services provided by companies like Wilson Learning and others, is the single largest expenditure of this money. So when you look at global standards for performance for U.S. companies, that is about a $37 billion question for them. So a very important question to have consistent, uh, meaningful standards for the organization. In addition, it's also important to our economy overall. We are the world's largest exporter of learning services to the world, and it's the, the fifth largest service export of the U.S. after um, technical support and legal and accounting services, learning services is the fifth largest export. So as a result, we think it's important to have very uh, good standards at a global level to create consistency, to, to make sure that the buyers of learning services have their expectations met, and it can be replicated. So I'd like to take a few minutes talking about the role of standards within the U.S. and how that have helped our industry evolve. A big part of the reason for standards in, learn in non formal learning services is that there are a large number of providers of learning services. They are profit and nonprofit organizations. They are very large organizations of thousands of people. They are very small organizations of one or two people. They are government providers um, as well as uh, universities and other organizations. So a wide variety of providers, which is only matched by the wide variety of buyers. Government buys a lot of learning services. Individual corporations buy a lot of in learning services, as well as do individuals, charities, um, professional associations, and unions are all different buyers. When you combine the buyers and the providers of learning services in the wide variety, you can see that without standards, there would be a lot of chaos in the industry. So we believe it's important within the U.S. industry, at least, to have something that brings the learning services together. Um, there are a number of different standards, and I'm not going to go through each of these in detail. Um, they are provided in the handouts that are available on the forum's website, but talk very briefly about some of the standards that we currently uh, try to follow within the U.S. One is the Academy of Human Resource Development has developed a series of ethical standards, the importance of making sure that the practice follows certain ethical guidelines. Um, uh, Dr. Raud mentioned ISO um, 10015. A lot of corporations are using that, or a lot of learning service providers are using that with their clients, with corporations, in order to um, help them achieve 9001 certification. Um, ASTD, the world's largest uh, association of training and development resources, has a certified professional in learning services and have a series of standards for what defines a professional within the learning service industry. Um, ISET develops standards to support the giving of um, credit, college credit or continuing education credit to individual learners. Um, the International Board of Standards for Training, Performance and Instruction has a series of standards for individual roles, for instructional designer, for trainer, and are developing ones for different kinds of trainers like online trainers, etc. And finally, Dr. Rao has already mentioned um, the two triple nine zero. Um, ISO standard for non-formal uh, learning services. I'd like to now turn attention, though, to I think the bigger issue, and that is how do we utilize standards and at the same time retain the creativity and innovation necessary in our field? We are a very young industry, and we need to continue to grow and evolve, and there are a lot of things changing in the technology arena that mean we have to maintain a level of creativity. ISO uh, 2990 was really designed specifically 
to support creativity. It doesn't specify how things are done, just what things need to be done so that you can cr continue to expand and great creativity. In my mind, when I look at the U.S. industry in particular, there are four critical innovations occurring within our industry that I'd like to talk about. The first one is learning performance transfer. Second is the integration of formal and informal learning. The third is how we assess the impact of learning services we provide. And the final one is something I call the leadership bubble. I'd like to talk about each of these for a few moments uh, time. First one is learning transfer to work performance. Learning transfer is a critical issue for businesses, in part because there has been not a very good um, capability of learning services to deliver performance improvement. Uh, in the beginning, um, learning services were focused upon a learning outcome. And though they tended to for, follow a traditional educational process, where a lot of the emphasis was on the learning event and very little emphasis placed upon anything outside of the learning event, so the seminar or the e-learning program. The end result of that is that learning services have not been effective at delivering performance improvement to organizations. In fact, um, Bob Brinkerhoff in a recent book documented that only about 15% <clears throat> of learning services creates value in organizations today. <clears throat> this was further supported by some recent research by Saxon Bellacourt at the University of Toronto, where I formed the basis for understanding why this occurs. <clears throat> that if you take a learning events approach, what happens is that immediately after that event, people start to forget. And if you forget, you stop using. And if you stop using, it doesn't affect performance. And so in their research, looking over a course of a year, found that on average, only about 35% of this, the knowledge was retained as a result of going through a learning event. So clearly, this process of focusing on the learning event has not been successful for organizations and corporations. And what's starting to emerge is a different model, a model that puts less emphasis on the learning event and more emphasis on what occurs before and after the learning event. What we call the assess, prepare, learn, and sustain approach to learning, <clears throat> where there's a focus on making sure that you're assessing the skill gaps that are occurring among the learners and the organization that you're preparing that learner. You're making sure they're ready for the skills and that they have the right kind of attitude and belief about their ability to learn. That the learning event itself is focused on usage and through interactive experiential activities. And then finally, that you sustain that learning over time by providing review, reinforcement, coaching, and tools to use in the application of those skills to work. One of the things we have found is that we actually did um, an extensive research study around the factors that impact <clears throat> the transfer of learning to performance and found that when you consider just these factors, there are about six different specific activities that organizations do that have an impact on whether or not learning transfers to the organization. You know, in terms of prepare, are they setting goals effectively? Are they creating the right expectations for the learner? In terms of learning, it's the experiential activities they incorporate and sustain, it's reviewing, and the providing of application. In addition, there are a series of factors associated with the learner and their readiness. Were they motivated to learn and use? Or how are they motivated to learn and use? Um, and do they have the confidence, the self-efficacy, the confidence to utilize the skills? And there are a series of organizational factors, factors that the organization as a whole have to address in terms of making sure that the skills are clearly job relevant, that the organization is aligned around the usage of new learning. Managers, particularly managers, support the learning, and that there's a culture of learning within the organization. And what we found in our research, looking at these 11 different factors, that you could improve the performance of learning um, by almost three times without those factors. So that if you take just a learning event approach, add to it these prepare, learn, sustain, learner readiness and organizational factors, you can triple the value of learning to an organization. So you can have a tremendous return on investment for, for learning when you incorporate you and you think about it less about an event and more about a process. In fact, recently we worked with a client and developed this overall process for them, a process that begins with skill gap assessments for the learner, 
These are all done through a series of emails that go out to the learners and to the learners' managers, incorporating the manager well before the learning started, maybe a month before the learning event itself. Um, then there was a series of pre-work that focuses on, on what we refer to as critical incidence-based learning, so that learners are the skills are described and the value of those skills are described, and they, then, they identify specific situations that they have to use those skills, that those skills would impact their performance in the organization. And they bring those critical incidences to a meeting with their manager to set goals for that learning. So they come out of, they go into the learning knowing what their goals for achievement are. At the same time, if there's a facilitator involved in the learning, the facilitator also gets those um, critical incidences so they can tailor the learning experience for those participants and help them in transferring that to the learning. As you can see, the learning event, the core learning event itself, is a smaller part of the process. But it doesn't end there. What we do after the core learning event is um, provide the manager and the individual learner with an ongoing series of email reminders and reinforcements. Um, the, the manager is given coaching tips and also instructions on how to hold what we call best practice sessions, or what this client called best practice sessions. And this occurs over about a three to six month period after the learning, continuing to reinforce um, and provide information about how to utilize these skills. Um, in addition, we followed what we called a push and pull strategy around this process. Each email contained a link back to a learning portal, what, what the client called the extended learning platform. And in this platform, they could get additional reinforcement. They could watch videos that model the behaviors. They could get reviews. They could get additional tools and application support for how to use these skills in their workplace, as well as tests, games, things that enhance the fun associated with the learning. The end result is that by adding the assess and plan and sustain to the learn only increased the cost of the learning experience by about 25%, but the organization got a 75% increase in the value of that learning. So a, a tremendous return on investment when you move away from thinking about learning as an event and more to thinking about learning as a process. I have two minutes. Two minutes? Okay, thank you. Let me briefly talk about the integration of formal and informal learning. Informal um, learning is a big issue within organizations today, um, partly driven by some research um, produced by um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the U.S., found that the amount of time spent in learning was, was much more in informal settings than informal settings, about 75% of, 70 to 75% of the time. But the interesting thing is that while most of the time spent was informal, most of the actual skill creation and acquisition occurred in formal learning. And so while informal learning is more frequent, it is less effective than formal learning. And um, leading a lot of organizations to realize that the true value in, in learning will come through the integration of formal and informal learning. This is a brand new area of research. Not a lot has been done. Um, there's a woman, uh, Jane Marinka, at the University of Minnesota, who's begun started looking at how do you create engagement in informal learning? How do you increase the likelihood that informal learning will be used in conjunction with formal learning? And has identified four critical factors. Manager support. The manager has to support and encourage the use of informal learning in support of formal learning. The organizational culture has to be designed to value the use of informal learning within the organization. That peers, um, and the, the learner's peers have to support it, and that the organization has to provide access to time and resources to engage in informal learning. The third major issue is impact assessment, or how do you measure the impact of learning in an organization? Learning professionals had often um, uh, felt bad is that their position within the organization relative to vice presidents of finance or vice presidents of marketing has never been as high. But then when you look at how we assess learning and how we measure the impact of learning, you can understand why. The focus has been on learners' reactions. Did the learner like the learning? Very less is focused on the actual learning that occurred and even less on the use of the behaviors. And what's worse is that when you look at how those things correlate with organizational performance, you find that there's almost no correlation or no ability to predict performance from these learning measures. Um, so as a result, what you have is a series of measures in learning that don't predict anything, which doesn't help you if you're trying to gain access to important business strategy decisions. 
What we have found is organizations have moved toward a process that turns that model upside down and really focuses on starting impact evaluation for learning at the business issue level and understanding the business issues and what, was, uh, what, and what are the metrics that the business uses to determine whether that's working effectively. And from there, build a learning evaluation process. Not the other way around where you start with the learning objectives and then me measure um, how well learning occurred. The last area, and I'll do this briefly, is what I call the leadership bubble. And it's not really a issue but it's a situation that is going to require a lot of creativity and innovation. I know that um, Nui San has um, expressed this in Japan as well, and it's been true in the U.S. When you look at the labor force within the U.S., what you see is a tremendous decline in the growth. This graph shows the um, percentage of people entering the labor um, labor force. What's even more telling is, is what's called the labor force participation rates. And in summary, basically what this graph is saying is that um, up until now, there has been a steady increase in the number of people in the labor force. Um, in about 2015, in the U.S. at least, and in other countries, the percentage, in, the percentage of people in the labor force will decrease every year. It will go down until about uh, 2020, and then it'll start to gradually rise to where it is about today at zero. So that the, the number of people entering the, the labor force is actually decreasing. And as a result, there are going to be few, few more, um, um, fewer talents available and fewer people able to take on leadership positions. So in essence, what we have is a streak, shrinking labor pool. So that where we have a large number of talented, experienced managers leaving the workforce and very few returning to take their places, creating it very difficult for, man for organizations to manage. Now, if this were the only problem, it would be easy to deal with. But when you look at the actual skills that current managers have, you find that it, it, it's, it, um, we're in real difficulty in terms of preparing the next generation of leaders. For example, we did a study of about 15,000 leaders. And these are their strengths. These are things they're good at, um, which are all kind of what we'd call um, hard skills knowledge of the organization, understanding competition, understanding business fundamentals. Where they lack, where there are huge gaps between where they are and where they need to be, are in the softer skills, the exact skills they need to develop the next generation of leaders. The ability to clarify objectives, the ability to coach and mentor other people, the ability to communicate clearly the organization's direction and strategy. When you combine these two things, the end result is an environment where we do not have leaders effectively positioned to prepare the next generation of leaders and a shrinking pool from which to draw those leaders. So in summary, for the U.S., effective learning services is important to our economy and we believe the global economy. That standards are important for creating quality in a diverse environment, and that we need to continue, but we need to continue within the structure of those standards to um, innovate new approaches to learning. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lembach. Uh, Dr. Lembach uh, explained about uh, the learning service, the meaning of a learning service or learning service industry in the U.S. and uh, how the standards can help the learning service industry and also mentioned about the core innovations in the learning services, especially for learning transfer. Uh, we used all the time assigned to this session, but I would like to extend the five minutes to invite any questions and to wrap up the session. So I'd like to uh, invite questions to the floor. Anyone? Yes, please. Please identify yourself and uh, uh, please mention who would like to give your question. Thank you, Han Kim. Thank you, Han Kim from the Korean Banking Institute. I have a question to Vice President Wilson, uh, uh, Michael Leinbach, and uh, I think is that we set a standard for education, and but the, I think the reason is that there are some obstacles to export the education service into other country. So, do you think what is the obstacle uh, obstacle to export the education service, and how can I overcome the obstacle? Thank you. Within the U.S., at least, the, uh, the, the different roads into human resource development have been varied a lot. Um, 
and it has been um, the major focus of education systems, universities and colleges within um, the U.S., to focus energies on defining and creating a, a uh, profession around human resource development. And so um, it, um, for new students in the U.S. at least, what we find is that they're coming to human resource development with greater um, standards of uh, performance, greater skills specifically addressed to human resource development, um, greater understanding of, of the role of ethical practices within human resource development. So that would be uh, my suggestion is, is really focus around where those skills lie within um, the educational systems within your organizations. Thank you. Any other questions? If there's no further question, let me wrap up this session. Um, this is the first time to introduce about the development of international standard for non-former uh, learning service providers. And uh, as you can see, uh, other countries are preparing or already have a kind of a, a domestic uh, standard. But uh, we didn't have in Korea. And uh, this can improve a lot for the uh, learning services uh, receivers or companies, but it could be a challenge uh, for the learning service providers. Those who can meet the standard, get the certified, can be a reliable service provider, as a, identified as a reliable service provider, but who don't may have a difficulty in the future competition. So this might uh, change uh, the industry of the learning service providers uh, globally, not only in Korea. And I think we need to have a more preparation to prepare and uh, to apply uh, this uh, standard when it's uh, finalized. Okay. I'd like to thank again the three distinguished speakers and all the participants. Thank you very much.